Okay, hello everybody. Uh, can you hear me? Good, thank you very much. Uh, welcome to our presentation. Uh, I'm really excited to see that many people here. And um, our presentation is about the integration of uh, Open Contrail and Open Daylight with uh, OpenStack. We want to talk today about the pain, the gain, and the lessons learned while integrating. So the contents of the presentation will start with general description of what to expect. Then we'll introduce ourselves and give credits to people who were very kind to help us with this presentation. Uh, we're going to talk about what SDN is and uh, discuss the benefits of SDN in modern networks and uh, touch on popular SDN controllers, which is in our presentation will be Open Contrail and Open Daylight. And we'll discuss the industry trends with regards to those uh, SDN controllers. And we have a, a lab demo that will be used during the presentation to demonstrate different things we're talking about. So this is a tutorial style presentation mixed with uh, some architectural descriptions. So um, we want you to have a recipe that works. And uh, this was the goal of our presentation. There will be no focus on specific features of any particular SDN controller. And we are focusing with, on integration with DevStack today. Uh, we're assuming that everyone in this audience has basic understanding of OpenStack. And um, there will be no vendor-specific discussions. We do not go deep into uh, protocol discussion. We're not going to talk about OpenFlow, SXMPP, and stuff. And we'll avoid discussions about which SDN controller is the best, or which one should be and should not be used. It's not the point. Uh, we're here as we work for Ericsson, and um, we're here also as an enthusiastic um, members of OpenStack community, and we strongly believe in um, open source collaboration and uh, development in open source uh, um, framework. So let me introduce myself. My name is Konstantin Kamaristi. I work for uh, Ericsson. I'm in telecom industry more than 20 years. I worked on different projects with different products. And uh, time came to get more familiar with uh, software-defined networking. Hence, we started working on this. And uh, let me present my colleague, Sayed. He's also a telecom veteran, has vast experience in network uh, equipment, network projects related, and um, many other things. And would like to say special thanks to our colleagues from Ericsson, Tim Inrich and Francois Le Marchand, who have helped us a lot, inspired us, and shared their vast knowledge on the subject. Uh, the SDN, as defined by Open Networking Forum, uh, has a long definition you can read. But I would like to uh, focus on the uh, highlighted keywords. It's a dynamic solution. It's manageable solution and cost effective. This is very important and adoptable. If it's not cost effective, it's not going to be adopted. <laughs> the solution uh, should decouple the network control and forwarding functions. and. Uh, it should allow direct programmability of networking devices. So this is, in brief, what SDN is. SDN comes to solve certain problems with traditional networks. Uh, we know that there are certain things that traditional networks are suffering from. Uh, I've listed a few points here. Uh, 
Traditional networks are mostly hardware oriented and static in nature. So any changes that needs to be done will require manual configuration and sometimes it's difficult to achieve within short times. The maintenance windows required and errors are possible. So the down times are possible. The distributed control plane lacks scaling. What does it mean is that the control uh, decisions are distributed across the networks in different devices. So uh, it's hard to synchronize that and uh, keep everything under control. More than that, management plane uh, sometimes uses proprietary implementations. So they're not always compatible and interoperability is not always great. So these are the shortcomings of traditional networking. So here's a great slide. It uh, depicts two use cases on the top where something like cloud is. It's like a wide area network, east to west, uh, with lots of routers and some networking equipment. Let's say if we need to introduce some changes or reconfiguration in the network, this requires um, work on all of those devices. And uh, like I said before, it's going to cost uh, a lot of time, effort, sometimes manual labor, and actually uh, can lead to errors and downtimes. Or on the bottom part of this slide, there is a data-centric uh, use case. For example, if we need to create another uh, web server and provide a VPN tunnel for this server to be accessible from outside, so here's a bunch of configuration needs to be done usually manually, usually time consuming, and uh, all in all, um, dissatisfying the customer and making things more expensive. So the SDN is supposed to bring changes that will make life better in this respect. So the centralized management and control planes, that means that the control function that was previously share, uh, divided between control and management plane now can be centralized in one uh, controller, one system. Another benefit is that control and data plan, plane can scale independently. So you don't need to scale control plane just to be able to scale the data plan and the other ways. The interoperability is improved. Uh, that's the promise of SDN. The networking devices can be programmed automatically. And this is uh, making operations cheaper and more efficient. It's possible to start using commodity hardware, also making operations more efficient. And the uh, adoption of SDN would facilitate migration to software-based networking. Uh, think of a paradigm shift that happens in the last decade in virtualization uh, in computing domain. So same thing is about or happening already in the networking domain. And finally, the uh, wider adoption of SDN will enable also adoption of scalable and dynamic applications. So that's the next thing that's coming. Uh, there are many, many SDN controllers on the market. There's a long history behind it. Um, we have put a link to some exhaustive list of uh, SDN controllers available. Uh, you are very familiar with one of them, which is Neutron. And uh, today, we're going to discuss Open Control and Open Daylight. In order to demonstrate this uh, int integration that we're going to talk about today, we have built a small lab. Uh, the purpose of this lab was exactly to show that this can be done in a very small environment, uh, fairly easy, and uh, it's easily reproducible and gives uh, 
uh, ability to experiment with SDN concepts in a small and cheap environment without big expense. So as you see, there is a Nuke uh, Intel little box with four CPUs, 16 RAM, gigabit, gigabyte RAM, and 250 gigabyte uh, hard uh, SSD. So we put uh, a latest Ubuntu image on it and uh, activated the nested virtualization. This is important. Most of the cookbooks uh, missed to mention that step. Maybe everybody knows, but some don't know. So this is a nasty surprise when you deploy everything and you cannot run the VM on top of VM. So you need to enable it from the base up. Here's one of the views on the architecture of open control. I don't have a pointer. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to talk? Do you want to talk? Or? Um, so uh, I'll take over and um, we'll go over the architecture of open control. But before we do that, um, a word of caution. If you're trying to explore the integration of SDN controllers with OpenStack, and if you do it for two weeks, uh, this is what you get. And by that, I mean gray hair and a little bit less hair as well. So we'll try to make that pain easy for you so the end result is not like this. Still bright and handsome, but black hair. Um, so let's, let's maybe understand a bit about the architecture because what we want to do is we want to make it easy for you when you integrate the components. And when it fails, where do you find the problem? I think that's one of the biggest challenges of open source and uh, OpenStack and the integration. So let's take a familiar view. And we start with the neutron. Um, a, so, someone told me that neutron is a poor, ma poor man's choice of SDN controller. So if you don't have SDN at all, you still got neutron. You know? So we've, we've got the neutron, which actually talks to the REST API in, um, in the management layer of the open control system. Uh, I was trying to move the mouse on my screen, but actually we don't see that there. So let's see if we can break it down. And okay. okay, so the view is slightly smaller, but I think it will help us, help us explain it a little better. So you've got Neutron on the top left corner, and you have your applications, OSS, BSS, GUI, et cetera. These are the ones that will actually want to create those dynamic networks, the, the virtualized networks. So they push in the request towards the REST API for your, uh, for your controller. Within the controller, you have three different main subcomponents. You've got the configuration node, the analytics node, and then the control node. The configuration node is responsible for receiving the requests and doing a high level to a low level translation. Analytics is responsible for continuously monitoring and analyzing the, the current deployments and seeing what's going on in your, um, um, in your forwarding plane. And the control plane is responsible for pushing the requests. Another way to look at the same is to look at the flow control. So here we are trying to show that OpenStack sends the request towards, uh, towards Neutron Server. Neutron Server talks to the control configuration node. Configuration node wants to make sure that whatever request has been sent is persistent, so it needs to store it in the database. Once that is done, it also pushes down to the control node, and the control node is responsible for pushing it onto your forwarding plane. Uh, one last view about this, and I promise I'm not going to drag this any further, and we'll go directly into the installation. But this, this I find really interesting because um, here you can see, yeah, here you can see the the setup. So uh, traditionally speaking, we we come from the uh, we come from the ODL family, and ODL came more more naturally to us because uh, we worked with o OVS for a long time. So the first thing we noticed when we were trying to deploy Open Control is, uh, where's my OVS? And there is no OVS. So you have these kernel modules which were built in, and they're part of a kernel. So instead of the agents, OVS agents, you have the vRouter agent, which replaces the OVS agent. And then instead of the data plane uh, that you find in, uh, in OVS, you have the vKernel module, for, um, which, which does the forwarding part. Uh, re rest of the setup is very, very similar. And this picture, I think, is a good depiction of what to expect when you're trying to analyze the call flow. So as a next step, we'll uh, take you into the details of installation. And Constantine has a lot to talk to you about the pains, gains, and what we've learned. OK, it's, now it's not so a lot, so it's shorter. So we have uh, installed a virtual machine on top of our KVM host. 
uh, it's important to use exactly this uh, version of Ubuntu 14.04.4. Most of the cookbooks that you can find, many of them on the internet, uh, do not mention the last digit, and this is a devil that is in the details. The compatibility of uh, libraries and image are very important, and uh, so far this is the only con uh, configuration uh, that has worked for me, and believe me, I tried a lot. <laughs> so uh, we've used uh, uh, the, this size, like a 15 gig of, gig of RAM and four CPUs, 70 gig of uh, hard drive for the VM, and we'll create two VMs basically on this uh, host, one for uh, open control and dev stack integration, the other one for uh, ODL and dev stack. But we s create them with the same um, size of the virtual machine and we can run them at the same time uh, in parallel. Uh, so kind of over, over committing. But it's not a problem because there is no load in this environment so they can coexist peacefully which we'll show later. So again, we need to um, not to forget to configure nested um, KVM Intel nested feature. Uh, you need to edit the grub file, update grub, reboot, and verify that it is in place. So the follow the steps as it's shown. Uh, uh, to have more control of the uh, uh, installation, I usually disable resolveconf and DHCP components. So in the middle of installation, sometimes I've seen that uh, resolveconf defines uh, something different as a gateway or some other DNS servers, and then the installation may fail. So I just delete that. And um, we need to install Git. We clone the uh, Juniper control installer project. I recommend to clone at the same time OpenStack DevStack project. So we're pulling the master branch from Juniper Open con uh, Control Installer, and we're putting stable Mitaka branch from DevStack. Uh, you should create the two uh, environmental variables, Control Deer and DevStack Deer. Uh, put it somewhere so it's always there when the user logs in. Um, and uh, now we're coming to configuration. Uh, we should have a f local RC file, which can be copied from samples. And uh, I recommend to uncomment the line control repo proto equals HTTPS. So in this case, the, the uh, getting of the packages that are needed during the installation will be done over HTTPS, so you would not need to configure SSH key. I recommend to change the number of jobs uh, to maximum number of CPUs available on your uh, KVM host or available to the VM. Uh, this is to make the build and installation a bit faster because it takes a long time. So we let four CPUs work uh, at full speed. And uh, something that I found during the installation, uh, I, need, I need to enable multi-tenancy in this file. Uh, otherwise, the installation will fail because the, some network for certain tenant ID cannot be created and the installation will fail. So this has to be done in two places. I'll, I'll show the, later I'll show the other one where it has to be done. So the steps to build open control are simple. So there is a file, uh, the script control.sh. So we need to build first. This takes the longest time, one hour, 12 minutes for my setup. And then we install. That's another half an hour. The other two steps are fast. As a result, um, if these two uh, environmental variables were uh, defined before and the dev stack um, GitHub project has been cloned already, then we will be able to run uh, the control uh, status verification script. Uh, so you should see all the components in active state, and uh, this is a good state. You should see that. Then we're going, going to the uh, next step, which is uh, building DevStack. So we go into DevStack folder and copying the glue file that is provided with the control installer uh, project. We're copying it into DevStack. Uh, 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 lib neutron plugins folder 
Then we create the uh, local RC configuration file, and uh, we need to change a little bit the configuration to match the environment, and uh, disable um, uh, this optional, but I recommend to disable Cinder uh, service, so we don't need the volumes at this time, and uh, it's going to make things easier and faster. So when we run this uh, stack sh script, um, it's always coming to a, an error uh, very quickly because of unmet dependencies. Uh, actually, the error prints out the recommendation how to fix that by forcing the installation. So I just chosen that uh, method. And then we rerun the stack, .sh. After 20 minutes, we get another error. And this, this, is, uh, this error is uh, showing up in most of the cookbooks available on the internet. Uh, you will see that uh, this is a popular fix. So it's also in this uh, cookbook. Then uh, I recommend to run the unstack and rerun the stack again. And yet we get another error after half an hour, which we can work around uh, by restarting the whole system and rerunning the stack again. So this um, takes another eight minutes for the stack to compile, uh, to, to start. And it's important to mention, um, I don't know if I can highlight it. Uh, no, I cannot. Uh, the before, the before building the stack, uh, OK, one second. I wanted to highlight this section. OK, so now can you switch back, please? Uh, I, I found that if, if uh, this is not done, then you would not be able to open the VNC uh, consoles to the instances that you're running. Uh, actually, you will be able to open the con consoles, but you cannot uh, type anything there. It will get some keyboard errors. So this is a workaround to uh, make it work. As a result, you get the functional environment with the, the stack dashboard and open control GUI. And uh, that is the working system. And now we can experiment with that. So now we're switching to ODL. And I give mic to Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to highlight a few things quickly before we move on, because a lot of us overlook these things. Uh, first of all, why Nuke and uh, why DevStack? Uh, we, we are lucky to, work, to, to be working for a company where if we want to do a project, we can get a lot of servers. But not everyone has that luxury. So we wanted to create a cookbook that can be, that can be used and deployed for anyone and set up the environment on their lab. So when your manager comes and asks you to uh, evaluate these technologies, you don't have to rent out or get the get the equipment, uh, a lot of service. The the other thing that Constantine figured out, uh, there's a lot of recipes that tell you how to deploy Open Control and ODL, and they tell you, okay, you need to use Linux uh, or Ubuntu 14.04, but the amount of variation when you go from 14.04.01 to 14.04.02 to 14.04.03, all the way up to different stuff. It, it changes things beyond your imagination. So if someone comes and tells you that, you know, um, open control and integration of OpenStack was so 2014, you, you tell them to talk to us. And we'll show them the logs that we have actually produced trying to make it work on different integrations. So, so apparently, it's very easy to do, but don't take it for granted. So we've tried to put in as many details as we can. So here you see the very specifics that you, you do. Um, also, it's worth it to mention that since we are taking the code directly from the repo, and repo is changing constantly. So whatever worked for you yesterday may not work for you tomorrow. These, these are the challenges that you need to be aware of. you know. And that's why you see, so luckily, the, the light is not that much. So you, you don't see the gray in my hair. But you would definitely see it next time if you're still doing this. And let's, let's go into ODL. Um, ODL was a little more natural to us because uh, we've, we've had a chance to work with it for a while. So, um, and, and apparently there's, uh, there's a lot more information of, that was easily available to us for ODL. It, it seems it's, it's well documented. So 
perhaps a recommendation from us from open source enthusiasts to open contrail community. Please start producing the documentation that will attract more people to, to open contrail as well if you want it to be successful. Just like what ODL has done. So let's start without going into too much details of that, let's, let's go into ODL. So the architecture of ODL is based on microservices. That gives you the ability and flexibility to add and remove services on the runtime. You don't need to reinstall, recompile, and things like that. You want to add BGP. That's a component. You download, you deploy, and you're good to go. The, I, I love that aspect of it. Platform independent. Um, I was having a conversation with Constantine about it. And you know, of course, we say that ODL is platform independent because it's run as a JVM. And then we got into a different discussion of, well, OK, that, that can be argued. But this is the information that we found on the ODL.org. So we've decided to present it as is. And uh, I, I think it works pretty well. The other important thing is that it's at parity with reference to Neutron. Uh, a lot of us um, here, because we, we are talking about OpenStack, so we are OpenStack-centric. So when we start exploring uh, SDN, we, we are more familiar with Neutron. So anything that, that claims and works, actually, and we've tested it, if it's at parity with what Neutron provides, then it's naturally more easy for us. Now let's get into the scary part of ODL. Um, if you're trying to ex understand the architecture of ODL, and this is the diagram that you see, it, it might look a little overwhelming for you at the, at the start, but we've tried to break it down. And I, I'll try to explain it in a way that I can explain it to my five-year-old nephew, and he kind of understood. So if he can understand it, I'm sure you guys can understand it too. So let's, uh, let's take a, a top, bottom, top to bottom approach. Uh, you've got the northbound interface. The northbound interface is where you'll receive the request from, um, from OpenStack. You'll receive the request from OSSBSS. And that's where you can actually deploy the application to, to ask ODL to do what you want it to do. On the center there, you've got the, uh, the control part. So this whole part, this is where you deploy your, um, uh, this is the, the modular um, MD SAL architecture. And you have the microservices running here. So you receive the request. And then depending on what the request is, you forward that request to that particular module. That module does what it needs to do and converts that onto the hardware equipment or virtualized equipment that you're working with. So if you're working with, um, with the typical hardware deployed Junipers or Cisco's or Sienna's, and you have plugins for those using, um, using protocols like XMPP or actually OVSDB, OpenFlow, BGP, and things like that, then it will get translated here, and it will get pushed down towards the southbound interface. One last thing about this architecture before we uh, go and see how we've done it in our lab. So this is the diagram that you actually see. Um, this is the connection. These are the different connections between different services. I will talk only about the OpenStack aspect because I think that makes more sense instead of talking about other things. So here you see that the OpenStack is sending requests towards the Neutron API. Neutron API sends a request to OpenStack Neutron services running in the Open Daylight Controller platform. Now here you have the option of using VTN, which is a new feature. And that sends the request down to your OVSDB. OVSDB is responsible for talking to your different um, um, OVS or host servers and pushing the configuration and the flows with OpenFlow onto your hosts. And if you're looking for the plugin architecture, this basically shows you the plugin architecture where you have the Neutron. We've eliminated Nova and Cinder, et cetera, et cetera. It, it makes life easier. It makes it easier to understand as well. And then you have the ODL controller in the center. And we, we see that everything actually is going through the MD cell data center. So you receive the request, and then this is the controller for the, uh, for the OpenStack services. And then you have the OVSDB and the OpenFlow talking to your compute host. So now let's go ahead and look at the, the installation that we have in the lab. And Constantine will walk you through that. Thank you. The five-year-old nephew that understands the concept of northbound interface is a little bit scary, but. <laughs> you have good genes in the family. OK. <laughs> OK, so the. Um, uh, the Open Daylight and DevStack integration is also running as a virtual machine. We have used the uh, Ubuntu 17.04 and uh, size the VM the same size as the uh, uh, OpenContrail VM. 
Um, same trick is used for controlling the IP environment. No resolve conf, no, no DHCP components. Um, we're installing Git and uh, we're creating a special user that will be uh, needed for building and running um, Open Daylight and DevStack. So the user is called Stack. So you, you will find these instructions in absolutely every uh, cookbook that you can find on the internet and in the official uh, ODL uh, documentation. Uh, so we clone the OpenStack dev stack and proceed with configuring the um, installation with local cloned file. I have found the very detailed instructions in the link provided on top of the slide. Uh, and I advise you to read through and try to understand all of the options available. Uh, you probably don't need all of them, but it's good to understand what they are before uh, spending hours in uh, reinstalling the system and finding that you're missing something that was important. But for your uh, uh, convenience, I've compiled a list of uh, uh, parameters that you should configure uh, in order to get a working configure, working uh, installation. So the, on the top, we configure the IP connectivity. And uh, on the middle of the slide, uh, there's lines starting with ODL underscore. Uh, we specify, specifically want to install the Boron uh, SR3 release. And these features that are listed below, uh, these are the features that will be available um, in the Deluxe GUI. GUI. Um, by default, uh, the ODL Deluxe Core f is installed, and that will not uh, let you see all the possibilities in the Deluxe GUI, so I recommend to put ODL Deluxe All during the installation. And also we've added ODL Layer 2 Switch All, so just use that and that uh, should work. And there is a bunch of services that we need to enable and disable. Uh, for Just to fit them on one slide, I've listed them in a line format. But in the configuration file, each, each parameter needs to be in a separate line. So these are the configurations. Running stack.sh takes approximately 20 minutes. At the end, you will get the uh, URL for dashboard and credentials, and also I've added this uh, boxed uh, text at the bottom of the slide. This is the uh, URL to log into Deluxe GUI and credentials. So as a result, you have dashboard and the Deluxe GUI. So if the uh, parameters were not correctly set in the configuration file, you will end up only with the topology um, view, and the rest of the views will be missing. So if you use the configuration as specified on the uh, slides before, you will get these uh, views in the GUI. So there is a nodes view and uh, Yang UI which I understand is a kind of SDK uh, with the possibility to send uh, REST API requests to different services and parameterize them. And it's uh, interesting to experiment with that. And there is also a young visualizer which uh, helps to visualize the data models and objects created in the configuration. So as a result, we have this environment with a host running two virtual machines. We've noticed that um, running side by side, uh, the open control virtual machine consumes more CPU than the ODL without any load in idle state. So it's something interesting. We don't know, uh, we never tested yet the uh, system under any kind of load, not in this environment for sure, but this is interesting to uh, to get these metrics in uh, future exploration. And uh, now we're getting to the end of the presentation and would like to discuss the industry trends in terms of adoption of uh, uh, SDN controllers discussed today. Uh, we have a list of uh, 
operators and vendors on this page that are using Contrail, open, open Contrail, and they are listed on the Open Contrail website. And these are big uh, companies. And we have a list of uh, operators and vendors that are involved with Open Daylight. It's interesting to see that AT&T and Juniper are also involved in this project. Uh, so it's it's not an indication of good and bad. It's an indication of specific uh, need, as use case, scenario. And uh, so it's, it's good to understand the difference. Oops. So also I would like to say that uh, on this summit there are uh, many uh, very knowledgeable people presenting the um, uh, SDN controllers. Do you, yeah. do you want to say? Yeah. No, no, go for it. So we've seen the Juniper stack, uh, Juniper uh, booth, and uh, it would be interesting to uh, talk talk to uh, engineers from Juniper about this, and uh, uh, you can ask them more questions, and for sure they will answer more, uh, give you more details, and add something ex exactly. Thank you. And um, Maybe I can have a word as well. yes, I'll give the mic to my. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we've tried to be as we were explaining before. We want to be vendor neutral. We we are not here to compare one with the other. We, uh, so Constantine here is telling you guys to go and talk to the guys in Juniper. I'm here representing Ericsson and ODL side of it. So make sure to to drop by the Ericsson booth as well. We've got some really fantastic people. Uh, who know a lot more about ODL than ourselves. So uh, this is something I promised the marketing guys, so th that is taken care of. Uh, I forgot to mention that uh, Ericsson is uh, actively involved with Open Daylight uh, project and uh, makes a lot of uh, code contributions upstreaming into Open Daylight project. So this is uh, uh, important to mention. So we have, I think we, we started a bit late because of the setup. So we have an option to, uh, or actually, we, we could have shown you the lab setup, but I think we should give time for the, for the next presentation, uh, presenters to, to come in. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. So actually, uh, two. One is, uh, did you uh, do apple to apple comparison in terms of the performance? Absolutely not. Okay. So so that was the whole idea. We're, we're not here to talk about the advanced apple-to-apple -apple comparison. We are here for the people who actually want to start the exploration of SDN with, uh, with, with OpenStack. Next question, please. And let's make it quick, please. OK. So uh, uh, in term, you, you showed ML2 path, uh, the neutron path, as well as the monolithic ODL. Correct. So the back end is exactly identical, or are there any differences? So the thing is, architecture is changing. Um, from one release to the other. For example, ODL last time had a Rev1 for the ML2 side, and they realized that uh, somebody in Japan was doing testing, and they found out that it can actually cause an event where you have parallel threads that can try to register the same network in the database. Now, in order to resolve that, they had to change the architecture, and now there's a Rev2 available. So as we move forward, we are actually trying to analyze different paths of what is the optimal way. So it's not a set architecture. It will not be final. It will continue to evolve. Guys, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your attention.